Hi, everybody. This is the lecture for week 13. Um, it's all about the cell cycle, and we'll talk about apoptosis at the end. So again, this would have covered a whole week of class. I've condensed the material a little bit, um, but this is an overview of the different phases of the cell cycle, and more importantly, how it's regulated. So if you haven't yet, please read chapter 18, um, or at least skim it and take some notes so you can anticipate some of the, the pathways that are coming up. All right, so before we get into, well, I'll, I'll share our agenda for the day first. Um, so there are specific checkpoints in the cell cycle that we'll talk about today, why they're important um, and how they're maintained. We'll also talk a little bit about um, the mechanisms for mitosis. So you guys have seen this cell cycle before, but we'll dig into what we have learned the past couple weeks and um, put that together with how um, we can move through mitosis. And then at the end, we talk about apoptosis um, and brace yourselves for some really dramatic vocabulary. It's kind of fun. Um, so just uh, to, to talk to you about the class as a whole, um, no lab activity for this week. I'll update you once I find um, some for the next couple weeks. Um, I've been updating what grades are possible on Moodle as we've kind of shifted different assignments around. Um, so, so look for that in terms of how many points are left in the class, and I'm happy to answer questions about that. Um, so you, you're working on your literature presentations. Um, I'll, I'll post the due date in multiple places so there's no confusion about when drafts and things are due. Um, but then the, the last kind of extra assignment, not extra, but the last component of the class need to fulfill before the end of the semester is something to address that global awareness um, blueprint category. So I've kind of teased this a little bit before, but you're going to read a couple different sources and reflect on the cultural context of biomedical research ethics. So you'll look at a situation involving stem cells um, in a group in Japan and the fallout from um, a couple of their papers that were subsequently retracted. So again, I, you'll get the full details on Moodle. If they're not up by the time you're watching this, then, then, then they will be up very soon. Um, so just uh, kind of quick reflection assignment, which is a little bit different than what we would have done in class, um, but something to, to fulfill that requirement. Okay, so otherwise, um, I'll keep to the schedule of posting slides and anything else um, for the course on Tuesdays um, with email announcements and, and anything else. Okay, so that's the kind of nuts and bolts for the class as a whole. Um, we have three weeks of instruction left, and then we have the regular final exam time, more details on, on what that final assessment will look like in a few, and then that's the semester. So we're getting toward the end. We're almost there. Um, you guys are doing great. All of that said, now we can get into the cell cycle. So you guys have seen this before in multiple different classes. Um, today, we're going to start with mitosis, walk through um, the different ways that it's regulated, the molecular components that we haven't um, put in the picture yet. We'll revisit microtubules and actin and myosin because they have important um, functions in mitosis. And then we'll kind of loop back around and think about how we regulate the other phases um, and interphase of the cell. So we'll, we'll revisit those, we'll visit those checkpoints um, and what players regulate if we do or do not start certain aspects of the cell, cell cycle, and then what happens um, if there's mistakes or if there's damage. Okay, so starting with mitosis, right, we, we need to replicate all of our DNA. It condenses into chromosomes and then we need to pull them apart. So the machinery that actually latches on and pulls them apart are the microtubules that connect to a very specific part of the centromere called a kinetochore. 
Um, so this is, again, on the centromere, there's one kinetochore on each sister chromatid, and they're oriented um, outward away from each other so that those microtubules can connect. And then when it's time for anaphase, they can pull them apart to opposite poles. So if we think all the way back to when we were looking at histone variants, this is why certain um, centromeric histone variants have loops in them, so that it can connect those microtubules to the kinetochore. So this image, you can see those individual tubules connecting. Um, different numbers of microtubules will connect to chromosomes based on what species. So humans have between, I think, 10 or 15, maybe more, that connect. But in yeast cell division, only one microtubule connects to each chromosome. So there's some variation there across species. Okay, so we've gone through the first couple steps of the cell cycle. We have our chromosomes. They're connected to the microtubules. And then in anaphase, there's actually a couple different um, moving pieces. So in anaphase A, it just, that describes the process of those chromosomes being pulled apart. And so we talked about how in microtubules, it goes in between um, adding and subtracting tubulin. So in anaphase A, tubulin is being taken off. Um, it's being depolymerized at the positive end right here. And that's going to pull the chromosomes toward the spindle pole. Um, in anaphase B, the spindle poles themselves are moving farther apart. Um, so there's kind of multiple forces that are moving the chromosomes to each side. One, the chromosomes are being pulled away from each other and moving toward the poles. That's anaphase A. And then at the same time, those are being pulled away from each other the spindle poles are, are pulling back. So anaphase A and B happen simultaneously, and it's driven by motor proteins. And so this image is, is breaking down those different motor proteins that are playing a role. So we're zooming out from this kind of snapshot right here of anaphase. We're focusing in on that centrosome or that spindle pole. And again, that's where those microtubules are able to grow out of. So we have three different instances where uh, motor proteins are playing a role. So in one on this diagram, we have that process of pulling the chromosomes toward the spindle pole. So here is where you're seeing the positive end of the microtubule depolymerizing. So it's, use, it's losing those tubulin molecules. At the same time, motor proteins that are interacting with the kinetochore and the microtubule are moving toward the minus end, pulling that chromosome to the opposite side of the cell. So here's that first instance. These motor proteins are moving along the kinetochore microtubules. At the same time, we have different motor proteins that are contributing to the spindle poles moving apart. So we have these motor proteins that have cross-linked um, what we call the polar microtubules. So these motor proteins then are moving the spindle poles away from each other, again, um, aided by this process of polymerization. So in this case, we're adding tubulin here to maintain um, that movement. And then the third instance of motor proteins that are assisting in anaphase um, are interfacing between the cell cortex and some microtubules that are attached to the spindle pole right here. So once these spindle poles kind of orient themselves close enough here, the motor proteins interact with what we call astral microtubules to, again, assist in pulling those spindles to the opposite poles. Important to make sure that those chromosomes are on either end so that when we split the cell in cytokinesis, we actually have the same amount of information um, in each daughter cell. Okay, so a little bit of review from um, the cytoskeleton. So now we're zooming back to the cell cycle as a whole, um, and we don't want mitosis to occur all the time, 
We don't want every single cell to undergo all of the phases of the cell cycle. So cells have very sophisticated ways of double checking that when it's time to do so, the cell is safe to move from one phase to the other. So there's three kind of major checkpoints um, that we've listed here. And each of those checkpoints help make sure that if conditions are not correct, or if there's damage, or if the cell is not large enough, then it's not going to continue to the next phase. So these are um, points in the cell cycle where the cell can self-regulate and figure out if it's okay to go ahead. Um, so in one instance, um, we've been in G1. We're ready to divide. Um, but we're going to check to make sure the cell is big enough. So there's certain molecules that will then um, make sure it's ready to continue to double the DNA, and different um, factors will go into that. So it needs the stimulation of certain growth factors um, to proceed. It checks if there's enough nutrients around. Again, if the cell is large enough, because if it's too small, um, that impacts the function. Um, also checks for DNA damage, right? We don't want to replicate DNA that has mutations in it. So that's one of the checkpoints. If a cell fails at this checkpoint, um, some of them enter a phase called G0. So it will stop its growth. Um, this is a phase common to a lot of cells that have differentiated um, and have no need to, to undergo cell division. Sometimes if a checkpoint fails, then it just waits for the conditions to improve or DNA repair to happen. Um, so a couple different directions we can go at this checkpoint. Then we have DNA synthesis. We've copied our DNA. Um, we're ready to divide. And at the end of G2, before we start mitosis, there's another checkpoint that checks for DNA damage, checks to make sure we've replicated each chromosome only once, and again, checks for cell size. Then that third checkpoint is between metaphase and anaphase. So before we start um, bringing those chromosomes on either end, if there's any misattachment, so if there's one sister chromatid that's not oriented properly, um, if, if nothing goes to plan, or if not everything goes to plan in the middle of mitosis, we can also pause here and either wait until something gets fixed or stop growth and division altogether, um, or it can induce cell death. All right, so these checkpoints are really important to make sure that the cell is ready to divide and that the conditions are appropriate. So throughout this lecture, we'll see how each of these points is regulated. And the key players um, for how these checkpoints work are pairs of proteins called cyclin-dependent kinases, and cyclins. So cyclins are needed to be bound to these kinases in order for the kinase to function. So as a little bit of a review, kinases are proteins that add a phosphate group to something else. So all of these checkpoints are regulated by different pairs of cyclins and kinases that depend on these cyclins to function. So this diagram is a little complicated, but we'll just um, walk you through it. So over the course of the cell cycle, which is this band down here, the number of kinases is not going to change very much. These are always kind of around. Um, but what does change is the amount of cyclin proteins. Because these kinases can't function unless there is a cyclin around, no need to change um, their amount. We can regulate their activity by changing the amount of cyclins. And instead of having a response where once you need them, you make a lot, cells have a really clever way of building up the concentration um, during the course of a cycle. And then when they need to use it for a checkpoint, they can activate them all at once. So let's take them step by step. So again, this purple line is the amount of kinase um, protein that are around. And that really doesn't change a whole lot over the course of the cell cycle. But let's check out this G1-S 
cyclone. So this is going to be that checkpoint before we enter cell replication. So over the course of G1, their concentration is going to go way up. Right before we get to that check, before we get to S phase, we have that peak of concentration. Then they're going to be active. And then we don't want them to be active anymore, so they are the cyclin proteins are degraded, their concentration goes down. So these are the ones that regulate that transition to S phase. The S cyclin um, is increased over the course of G1, kept around during S phase, and then when it's no longer needed, it's degraded. Okay, so once we have G1S useful, then it goes down. Um, right before that activity, we're building up the next cyclin we need, so we're always prepared for when we need it. And then over the course of S cyclins building up, we're building up the M cyclin, which, which, are, which are needed for regulating that checkpoint in mitosis. So before they're active, we're just building their concentration along this line. And then once that checkpoint is reached in mitosis, it's active. And as soon as we pass that checkpoint, it's degraded because it's no longer needed. So the cell keeps um, the amount of cyclins around that it needs in order to function at those checkpoints. And if it's not needed, it's either being degraded, so it can't function outside of when it's supposed to, or it's being built up so that when we need it, we can just activate them and they're ready to go. Okay, so again, those checkpoints specifically are regulated by a kinase protein, which phosphorylates other things, um, which is dependent on these proteins called cyclins, so named because their concentration changes throughout the course of the cell cycle. Okay, so we'll All right, you heard my husband calling me, I think. Okay, so here's a specific example of one of these pairs in action. So we're going to see um, the checkpoint before S phase. So that part in G1 where we're making sure conditions are right. Before we get to that point, this protein called RB stands for retinoblastoma. But RB is bound to this transcription factor. So this prevents this piece of DNA from being transcribed. So RB inhibits transcription and translation of proteins needed to begin S phase. So when RB is bound, we're not going to proceed to S phase. Now the cell is growing and getting ready. In the presence of certain growth factors, so some kind of signaling molecule, this is going to turn on the RAS pathway. And then at the end of this pathway, it's going to activate a specific CDC, CDK cyclin complex. Okay, so we're not ready to start S phase. Um, however, the cell gets the signal, tells that we're ready to, to continue. It activates the CDK cyclin. Um, and that uses energy then to phosphorylate that RB protein. When the RB protein is phosphorylated, thanks to that kinase, it uh, dissociates from that transcription factor, allowing the transcription of those genes needed to proceed towards cell replication. So in response to a signaling pathway, CDK cyclin becomes active and removes this inhibitory protein. So once um, this protein is removed, we can move toward S phase. So depending on which checkpoint is going to change which CDK cyclin pair we're using. OK, so here's another example of how these are working. So um, certain cyclins don't work in isolation. Um, over the course of their activation or deactivation, um, they're able to regulate 
other CDK proteins. So in this specific example, we're looking at this kinase CDK1 and how it interacts with a protein called cyclin C. So if you want a little overview of the different kinds of cyclins and CDKs, you can check out um, 18, table 18-2, I think, in your book. But in any case, CDK1 pairs with cyclin B. Once we've built up enough concentration of cyclin B, it associates with CDK1. And then there's three spots, if you're a vertebrate, where the CDK1 will be phosphorylated. Um, and that process is um, catalyzed by a couple different proteins. But we phosphorylate CDK1, and instead of phosphorylating it to activate it, there's actually uh, one or two sites that are inhibitory when they're phosphorylated. So specifically on these three uh, amino acids, we have a phosphate group on this complex. And the reason we've phosphorylated it um, without activating it is to build up this concentration over the course of G2. So once we activate it, it's going to start the process of mitosis. So we don't want um, a gradual increase of this protein. We want enough of a concentration that when we do activate it, it's ready to go and everything starts at one time. So this tyrosine residue right here inhibits CDK function. So once we've built up um, enough concentration, once we've reached the end of G2, now we want to proceed to mitosis. So some kind of phosphatase will dephosphorylate those regions that inhibit its function. So once we remove these phosphates, bam, this complex is active, starts the process in motion to begin mitosis. Okay, so great, we started mitosis. As soon as we start that process, then we want to make sure it goes through the next step of the cell cycle. We don't want to reinitiate mitosis. And so it degrades the cyclin B protein. So that's kind of that drop off from that graph. Um, there are certain molecules that you can add to proteins to trigger the cell to degrade them. It releases those cyclin B proteins, they get degraded. And again, that amount of CEK kind of stays constant in the cell. When it's time for that cell to go through mitosis again, during G2, we'll build up that concentration. And when it's the right time, remove those inhibitory phosphates. OK, so a couple specific examples of how these cyclins and CDKs regulate the cell cycle. OK, so in order to degrade those cyclin proteins, um, I mentioned that you add specific molecules that signal the cell to degrade them. And that's called ubiquitin. So this proteasome pathway, right, this breaking down of proteins, relies on the addition of ubiquitin molecules. And this is mediated by a couple of different enzymes. So E1 uses some energy, gets a phosphate, interacts with E2 and E3. These then are able to add um, ubiquitin. It doesn't take just one molecule. It takes several molecules of ubiquitin to signal protein degradation. So once this complex interacts with the target protein multiple times, um, this proteasome, this enzyme that breaks down proteins is recruited which then shreds that protein to small bits. So when we destroy proteins, we add a bunch of ubiquitin molecules, thanks to these bigases right here, things that add molecules to other proteins, and then it gets degraded. OK. So bringing it back then to regulating the cell cycle, um, there's a complex called the anaphase promoting complex. So it does just like it sounds like once it's active, it's going to start anaphase. And some of the enzymes that are part of this complex 
are E2, E3 ubiquitin ligases. So those, I'll go back one slide. So in that complex, it contains these two proteins right here. So the anaphase promoting complex partly contains these two enzymes right here that add ubiquitin molecules to signal degradation. So where does it focus its destructive energies? Well, in order to promote anaphase, we need to degrade uh, a couple of different types of proteins. So there are certain cyclins, right, like cyclin B, that promote mitosis. The anaphase promoting complex will break those down. Again, this helps um, go toward the next phase of the cell cycle, prevents it from um, doing something we don't want. So the anaphase promoting complex will degrade the previous cyclins. There's also a couple of different proteins that are, are kind of keeping those chromosomes in the right place. So the anaphase promoting complex also degrades a protein called cohesin. And this is a ring-shaped protein that holds both sister chromatids together. So we don't see this often in, in diagrams of chromosomes, um, but the sister chromatids are actually held tightly together, kind of like those um, plastic rings along around soda bottles. So this anaphase promoting complex, right, in order to break them apart, that anaphase promoting complex will, will break those, will degrade those proteins, which allows them to be pulled apart. Um, there's also a, a protein called securin, which does kind of what it sounds like. It holds things together. Um, so the securin keeps another protein called separase inactive until the cell is ready for, meta, for anaphase. Excuse me. So this APC, this anaphase promoting complex, starts anaphase by, by degrading the cyclins that start with mitosis. It breaks the bonds holding the sister chromatids together. And it also um, gets rid of this protein that is inhibiting a protein called separase. And so we see that separase being bound to securin right here. Once that complex degrades securin, separase can contribute toward pulling those sister chromatids apart. Okay, so here's another view of that same exact process. This one is from your book. Um, so just so that you get a, a visual of what this looks like, here are those cohesin complexes that are, are keeping those sister chromatids together. This active complex with those E2, E3 ligases will signal the degradation of securin, this inhibitory protein that signals or that activates the separase. Separase is an enzyme that catalyzes the separation of the sister chromatids. All right, so that's how we get um, to anaphase and through anaphase. Now we've made it to telophase. And right, the whole um, point of mitosis is to divide the nucleus. Really early on in the mitosis, that nuclear envelope is broken down. And then once we've made it through anaphase and telophase, we've, we reform um, that, that nuclear envelope. And so this process is mediated also by phosphorylation. So when we're breaking it down, a lot of these individual components are phosphorylated. So we have... Um, pieces of membrane attached to those lamin, um, nuclear lamin molecules, which are those intermediate filaments. We also have those pore complexes, um, which by breaking down envelope, now our chromosomes are able to undergo mitosis. And all of these components hang around in that cell until it's time to reform. So other proteins then will, will dephosphorylate the individual pieces, which are then able to, to morph back together and reform that nuclear envelope. So over the course of um, the cell cycle, over the course of mitosis, that envelope is broken down. And then once we get to telophase, we're able to rebuild it to form those two new nuclei. Um, 
So we've made it through telophase, and now it's time to split the cell into two pieces. So just like we mentioned um, in our cytoskeleton lecture, in order for cytokinesis to take place, it's mediated by um, some of those pieces of the cytoskeleton. So we have our actin and our myosin that contribute to that contractile ring. So specifically, the contractile ring in animal cells forms perpendicular to the microtubules that go between um, the two spindle poles. So we call them polar microtubules because they're, they go from one end to the other. And specifically, the contractile ring is formed perpendicular to that. So there are some signals um, that aren't fully understood that direct where that contractile ring to form so that it splits the cell evenly in two so that we get two identical daughter cells. Over the course of development, sometimes we don't necessarily want two identical cells. Um, so those polar microtubules, those spindle poles, will move around in the cell to create an asymmetrical cell division. So there's still um, some mystery involved into how that process takes place. Um, but when we split into two, we're using those actin and myosin molecules to bring that envelope closer and closer together until the cell splits. So that's the case for animal cells. But when we're talking about plants, we have that cell wall to deal with. So instead of um, forming a contractile ring and splitting in two, what happens in plant cells is that they basically just build more material between those two nuclei in order to, to separate those cells. And so in plants, that process is mediated by a structure called a phragmoplast. So that forms right in the middle of where um, those remnants of those polar microtubules are. So this complex will recruit um, vesicles full of materials needed to build up that cell wall. Um, so the, the nuclei will reform on either side, and then that phragmoplast will signal vesicles to come in with that wall, with, that, uh, with those materials to build a new wall. Okay, so a little bit different process compared to animal cells, but still mediated by those, those microtubules and that phragmoplast. Okay, so now we're, we're kind of restarting the cycle. We've made our way through mitosis. We've split our cell in two, whether that's cleaved in half or just um, built into two new cells. And now we're at that checkpoint thinking about replication. So these cyclin CDK pairs um, also contribute to deciding whether or not to replicate our DNA. And so this is mediated by um, a couple different enzymes. So the protein CDC6 in G1 is going to be bound here, this green protein, to a complex called the origin recognition complex, or ORC. So this ORC sits right on top of that origin of replication of our DNA. And during G1, we have the CD6 bound. So as we progress through G1, if, CD6, if CDC6 is bound, it's going to recruit DNA helicase. Because we have two strands, we want one helicase on each side. Once it recruits helicase, the CDC6 is going to dissociate so that the cell can prepare to replicate DNA. So once we have our helicases around, we call this the pre-replicative complex. All right, so we're locked and loaded. We're ready to go. We're just waiting on the right signal to begin replication. So if all goes according to plan, our SCDK and for S phase, or replication, is going to come in. Again, kinases add phosphate groups. So this SCDK will phosphorylate that complex, which activates it, which sets in motion DNA replication. 
So we start with these proteins bound, we recruit helicases, this protein leaves, it gets the right signal in, which starts replication. So this SCDK is what mediates the beginning of DNA replication. Okay, so this machinery is really good, um, but sometimes mistakes do happen or there might be some other environmental cause of DNA damage. In the case of DNA damage, the cell is able to release a protein called P53. So in this case, our DNA was damaged by some x-rays. We release or activate this P53 molecule. This enzyme then binds to a certain regulatory region. P53 activates the transcription, um, which goes to the translation of a molecule called P21. And P21 inhibits the proteins required for those checkpoints. So if our DNA was undamaged, P53 would remain inactive and our cell cycle would continue as normal. However, if we receive damage to our DNA, we don't wanna A, replicate it, or B, if we've already replicated and it gets damaged, we don't want to propagate that damage to an identical daughter cell. So in the, in the response to damage of our DNA, P53 activates the transcription of the RNA that codes for P21. And then P21 will then inhibit either the G1S cyclins or the, the S, CDK cycling complex. So we're, we're talking about cancer in two weeks, um, but I think the statistic is in 50% of certain cancers, we see mutations or changes in this P53 protein. Okay, so that's what happens if our DNA is damaged. The ultimate response to DNA damage, if we can't fix it, is to um, kill the cell itself. And so this process is called apoptosis, or programmed cell death. So we'll look at two scenarios of this P53 activation. So just like we saw on the previous slide, we have our damaged DNA. It creates this, or activates transcription of P21, which inhibits the cyclins, which prevent the cell from continuing through the cell cycle. So if we can't fix the damage that, um, resulted in the activation of P53. Then we go another route. Um, P53 is also involved in this um, signaling pathway. <coughs> and this is what will set apoptosis in motion. So in this case, P53 also activates the transcription, but this time it's going to activate a protein called Puma. And what Puma does is it basically pounces on, or inhibits, a protein called BCL2. So this protein is always around. The machinery to start apoptosis is always around. So you want inhibitors of that process to be active and ongoing. So what Puma does is it inhibits the activity of BCL2 which starts in motion the process of apoptosis. So again, BCL2 normally represses the start of apoptosis. In response to DNA damage, this protein called Puma inhibits this one, thus starting the pathway. Okay, so I promised some dramatic vocab for apoptosis. It's a pretty dramatic process, um, so here we go. Um, so if we let the cell continue to divide, it's bad news because then we're copying mistakes which could, which could be deadly. Um, but we also don't want to just let the cell explode and emit its contents everywhere because that can damage nearby cells that, are, that could be healthy. So apoptosis essentially is just a way of containing um, the cell as it's dying. So if we had P53 introduce this process, then once we start apoptosis, 
it will continue on. So there's no kind of starting in the middle of apoptosis or stopping in the middle. So one of the first things that happens is that nuclear lamina gets broken down. So that nucleus kind of deforms, um, the DNA condenses, the cytoplasm shrinks down. Um, so these images are epithelial cells. So normally they're flat, interacting with each other. Once the cytoplasm starts to shrink, the cells kind of ball up like this and round out. And then over the course of this shrinkage process, it forms these little blebs, the actual scientific name for these little um, bubbles of cell fragments. Once we get to this stage, which is depicted here, all these little blebs, this is one cell undergoing apoptosis. Um, a cell like a macrophage is going to come along and engulf these blebs or these apoptotic bodies. And so this is kind of a visual representation of what's happening, just controlling um, kind of this inward shrinkage process. And then another cell is going to come around and contain it so that its cell contents doesn't damage other cells. So how does this process work? So the next few slides will, will take you through the proteins that are involved in making apoptosis work. So the, the important proteins for this process are called caspases. Right here, caspases. These are the ones that are going to mediate the process of programmed cell death. So when they're inactive, right, they're, they're kind of just in the cell, inactive, not doing anything. Um, but when they're activated, the end terminal ends are cleaved, and they're able to associate in this dimer. So to activate this protein, we need to cleave um, certain sites. It can fold properly um, to form these dimers of large and small subunits. So inactive, activated. Once these cast pieces are activated, they can um, start these other processes. So these are proteases, so these are going to break down other proteins. And so some of their targets are those lamins, those proteins giving the nucleus structure, other cytoskeletal elements, um, and DNA inhibitors. All right, so there's enzymes called DNases that are floating around all over the place. We want those to not influence our DNA if the cell is healthy. Once we start apoptosis, um, these proteases are going to break down things that prevent DNases from activating. So our DNA then is going to be chopped up over the course of apoptosis. Another function of caspases is to activate what we call executioner caspases. So kind of like when we saw in our um, signaling pathways, um, there are multiple different kinds of caspases. So the ones that are turned on early in the process can activate later caspases. And so there's multiple different kinds of executioner caspases. OK, so we started this degradation process we're going to follow through the signaling pathway. So here's an example of um, a pathway that's being amplified. So this activation of this caspase then can turn on other executioner proteins, which can recruit even more executioner proteins. So this first kind of layer is able to degrade the structure of the nucleus. And then once we recruit more and more proteins that are involved in breaking down other proteins, we see cleavage of, of other essential cytosolic proteins. OK, so sometimes we see um, extrinsic signals come in. Um, but sometimes, if there's damage just within the cell, it can set apoptosis in motion as well. So there's extrinsic and intrinsic ways of initiating cell death. So I'll back up a couple of slides. Um, so this was an extrinsic way. So there was some kind of outside signal that said it's time to die. 
it got this in process initiated, and now we're looking at a process intrinsic to the cell. So something happened within the cell that's going to lead to apoptosis. Okay, so something happened, some irreparable damage is in the cell. This signals um, a really important process, um, and that is the release of cytochrome C from the membrane of the mitochondria. So it's really important to cellular respiration. If cytochrome C leaves the mitochondria, you know shit's about to go down. So cytochrome C leaves the mitochondria, it's in the cytosol, it interacts with a protein called an adapter protein, and this complex forms um, this ring structure which recruits a caspase. Right, so this is an inactive one, it associates with this big complex that contains cytochrome C, and it forms this structure called an apoptosome. So this apoptosome, then all the pro all the caspases are active. They can degrade other proteins, which leads to apoptosis. So all of this is regulated by a family of proteins called BCL2. So there are some BCL2 members that promote apoptosis, and there are some that inhibit it. So if something happens to the proteins that inhibit apoptosis, there are two BCL2 members that then contribute to the beginning of apoptosis. And those are BAC and BAC, B-A-K and B-A-X. These are the proteins that release the, the cytochrome C into the cytosol. So once we eject cytochrome C, it begins this process in motion of apoptosis. So executioner proteins, um, very dramatic process, um, but actually it's, it's necessary in development. So when we think of the metamorphosis of tadpoles to frogs, the way they're able to get rid of certain tail structures and other things is through the process of apoptosis. They're able to tell these cells um, to die and break down, and other cells are able to differentiate. Um, so it's important for almost all vertebrate growth processes. So in development, our hands are actually webbed. So paws and hands, um, in order for our fingers to become separated, we require apoptosis of the cells that connect these digits right here. So organs, structures, um, but also just within the... Um, Within different tissues, apoptosis is really important. So we make way more neurons early in development than we'll retain. Um, and that's because, like we saw really early on in the cell signaling lecture, in the absence of certain signals, that also triggers apoptosis. So we make a ton of nerve cells, but those are competing for a certain amount of survival factors. So we've made all these neurons, but there's not enough survival factor to go around. And that leads to only some neurons surviving and others undergoing apoptosis. So metamorphosis, um, early development in organs and also tissues on the individual cellular level. So it's not always this dramatic process in response to cell damage. It's also very necessary in development. Um, and so after we've um, grown up and developed, there's always the possibility of um, things that can damage cells. So in the case of viral infections um, or cancer cells, there is mechanisms in place to try to um, mitigate that damage. So here's some more dramatic vocab. Um, so say we have a cell that's been infected or something that's growing uncontrollably and not cooperating. Um, so on all of our cells, we have what are called FAS death receptors. So these are present on the surface all of the time. And in the case of 
um, a cell needing to undergo apoptosis, a killer lymphocyte will come around with a type of ligand that will bind those death receptors. Okay, so our immune system is gonna kick in. It's gonna bring these ligands in to interact with these death receptors, so named because once they bind the appropriate protein, it's going to start the process of apoptosis. And it does this by recruiting an adapter protein, which binds another caspase, procaspase 8. And all of these bind together to form DISC, or the death-inducing signaling complex. So the death receptors initiate the formation of the death-inducing signaling complex. This activates those caspases, which then can trigger the executioner proteins, the executioner caspases, and ultimately lead to apoptosis. It's like a Shakespearean drama on the cellular level. So that was the cell cycle in a nutshell. We learned about the different checkpoints. We learned about the proteins that regulate those checkpoints. We learned a little bit of um, those mechanisms for mitosis. Um, we also looked at apoptosis as a necessary process for development, as well as a response to damage. Um, and I think this topic does a really good job of bringing in your prior knowledge about signaling and motor proteins and how proteins interact with each other. Um, so those are if the processes go according to plan. Um, that doesn't always happen. So week 15 in two weeks, we'll look specifically at um, cancer and cancer cells in addition to stem cells. So that's all the information I have for you for week 13. Um, check back for the quiz that covers this material. And I will also post, if it's not up already, information about that global awareness activity. No lab this week. There will be a lab activity next week. Um, and as always, if you have any questions or concerns or just want to reach out, please let me know. All right. Good work. You guys are doing great. Um, I'm really proud of you for handling this transition as well as you guys are. Um, more information from me soon.